Hi, uh, welcome to the bathtub. This is Scott Bradfield. We're come, trying to get these down to shorter, less than 10 minute pieces. Um, and I'll try to do these as quickly as I can from now on because I've got a lot of different books I've been reading and enjoying lately. Um, and this, I wanted to do this one, doing a few in advance because I read a lot of books recently and I forget things so quickly that I didn't want to forget the stuff that I loved about this book. This is James Tiptree Jr. We talked about Kate Wilhelm a few weeks ago, a writer who I loved when I was a kid. And Tip Tree was another writer who I loved when I was young and loved and hated. I can say, I loved, got annoyed by. Or, I don't even, she was a very difficult, sometimes an exasperating writer to read. James Tip Tree Jr., if you don't know of him, her, was a writer who published science fiction, short stories in science fiction magazines when I was reading them back in the 60s. And they were uh, very different stories. And they received a great deal of attention from a lot of the more serious and intelligent SF writers at the time, like Ursula Le Guin and Robert Silverberg and Harlan Ellison and Harry Harrison and the writers who had, and Kay, uh, who, who were, uh, the, the smart writers were all reading this, this writer, James Tiptree Jr. And it was a weird name. Nobody had heard of the name Tiptree. At one point, I think Robert Silverberg writes an introduction to a book, and he says, I've looked up Tip Tree in every phone directory in New York, and there are no Tip Trees. And everyone sort of knew it was a pseudonym. And there was something about the letters. This, this writer issued lots of letters and typewritten letters to everybody. He was a big correspondent. And th there was a huge amount of interest in Tip Tree and the type of work that, quote, he did. There was also a big debate going on when I was a kid. I remember people saying, well, was it, was it a man or a woman? And certain people like Le Guin, I remember Le Guin saying, well, you know, I think it's a woman. Why do you think it's a man? And I remember a lot of the men, men writers were writing these essays saying, what well, has to be a man. He just writes, they use the term muscular prose. And it doesn't really matter to some extent. But it was an interesting discussion when I was a kid. And the thing was, is the stories themselves were very peculiar, brilliant, exasperating stories. So I went back and reread th this book. As, as I've told you in the past on the, on the, in the bathtub, is I'm really kind of against these best of. It's easy to get the best of Tip Tree or the best of uh, a certain writer. But going back to read the actual single author collection, and this was the first Single author collection by Tip Tree, Ten Thousand Light Years from Home. Tip Tree makes lots of references to rock songs, the Rolling Stones, and poets. She's a very well-read reader of poetry, and she's constantly wrote, quoting E. Cummings and Hart Crane, and she's she's uh, she's often throwing in uh, references to poetry in her work, as well as music titles. So this is a good book to go back to if you can find this first edition or any edition of this first book of hers, it's much more interesting to me than the best of James Tiptree. So to make a long story short, there was a lot of debate over James Tiptree. It turned out James Tiptree Jr. was a woman. His Her name was Alice, I'm looking this up, make sure I've got it, Alice Bradley Sheldon. She, her, she, Sheldon was her married name. And where the hell is that going? Okay, she, uh, Alice Bradley was her was her maiden name. She came from a pretty well off family in Chicago. She was in the military. She married a military guy, and then she got into the CIA, and she worked for the CIA for twenty years. Just really a weird character. And somewhere in the fifties, got sick, hated the CIA. And this is one of the most. This is a really interesting woman politically. She knows all the crap America's doing all over the world and is not happy about it. When you read this book, you can tell. And she gets out of it. She goes gets a degree in psychology, incredibly bright woman, obviously, and starts writing these stories and publishing them in science fiction magazines fairly well along in her life. I guess she must have been in her 40s, late 30s, 40s, when she started publishing the stories. They are so idiosyncratic and so different and different from one another and sometimes very difficult to follow. But they are often concerned, they, they often are concerned with the way people discuss women or the way women are treated. But even more so, they're really concerned with the way the American political system is just completely corrupted. There's one hilarious story in here, a very difficult one to read called 
um, oh God, I can't remember the title, I'm Too Big But I Love to Play, where uh, one of the central riffs is about how all research development now is about making money for the weapons industry, basically, and about applied science and how research is not about truth anymore. It's about the breakdown of truth. And there's lots of these riffs in uh, Tip Tree uh, throughout her career. Um, some of the stories, she's also very interested in kind of uh, cultural histories and the way, you know, uh, society, uh, anthropological research. Not research, anthropological life and how cultures mediate and interrupt and destroy one another. There's two two of the possibly the less famous stories are two of my favorites. So there's two types of stories in this. There are ones in here, such as the snow. Uh, the snows are. This is a very weird book. It's terribly t proofread. There's tons of typos, and mistakes in it. It doesn't have a proper. It was really cheaply made by Ace Books. They didn't put any time into it. And they don't even have a proper table of contents. So it's hard finding your way through this book. The snows are melted and snows are gone. I still don't, I, I didn't understand when I was a kid. I don't understand it now too well. A story called The Peacefulness of Vivian, which is a very difficult story to follow. But many of her stories kind of require a second reading, almost as soon as you finish them. And the old underlying premise of it is that there's this alien character that wanders through cultures, basically betraying them, betraying them to these huge international, um, intergalactic, um, militaristic society, and who come in and really just destroy everybody. So he, basically, it's about a, a tool, a tool of empire, she refers to him at one point, and how that person is so con disconnected from the horrible things that he does that he's peaceful. He's happy with his life. It's an incredibly complicated idea for a science fiction magazine. Many of these stories were published, I think, by Fred Frederick Pohl, who was the was the the uh, collaborator of the great C. M. Cornbluth, and who wrote some interesting satires. Nowhere near as interesting as these, but they were published. And some of the most difficult book stories she wrote were published by Pohl in places like Galaxy and If. Um, so some of the stories are very, they take a lot of following, a lot of patience, pain-wise. They, they go from fairly small focus stories, which are pretty easy to follow, to very large, very complicated stories that require almost a second reading as soon as you read them. Two of the easier stories to read are about someone working for the CIA. Some of the stories are hilarious. I read these over the past week. Mom, one's called Mama Come. Is that called Mama Come Home? Mama Come Home. That is okay. Mama Come Home is about a guy working for the CIA. This is a very dark, weird satire, and a bunch of like nine foot tall women come in a spaceship and come to Earth, and they come saying, "Oh, well, they're just hanging around and wandering around and so forth," and they. They start to treat Earth people the way um, sailors used to treat the Polynesians when they first used to go over their trading, basically screwing everything that moves. So screwing all these guys, treating them like trash, treating them basic, basically treating uh, the men in this in Earth's culture as throwaway items. There's a couple of scenes where they, the CIA is sending in these men to sleep with these nine foot tall aliens who rape one of the characters. There's, there's a scene where one of them is, is raped in a kind of horrific scene for a satire and a comic story. And he's beaten and left in a hospital. And they send these guys in and there's a couple of sh shots where the CIA is taking photos of these nine foot tall women uh, ha getting drunk and screwing all these guys. And they, and they aggressively screw the guys. And so it's a, there's a kind of sexual uh, inversion here. And, uh, they, uh, the guys, there's one scene where a guy's sitting on one of these girls' laps, <laughs> you know, wearing her helmet. <laughs> it's, it's, such, it's such a dark, funny, horrific vision of being treated like toy boys, basically. So the, the joke is, of course, that they have this, the joke of that story is that, you know, we could be treated by alien cultures the way we've treated our own cultures when we go visit them. And there's a second, a sequel to that story where religion is the same. Uh, another group of aliens come to Earth 
and they they show a lot of they're very peaceful and they sing and they're always holding hands and dancing and they're basically kind of alien Christians and they come here and after they've gotten to know the lay of the land they basically think of us as savages and they're disgusted by us and they destroy all our they just just basically start to treat us the way you know earth our religions have gone to other countries and treated the people who live there so it's horrific and funny at the same time uh, there's another story called i like the stories that aren't as well known as some of the others there's one called i'll be waiting for you when the swimming pool is empty which is a very funny story about a, an earthling going to another culture and again meddling with other cultures is a big issue in tip tree um and a really dark concluding story called beam us home the reference to Star Trek is a deliberate reference to Star Trek. And the idea that, and, and here's a story from the 60s, which is talking about American militarism and the complete corruption of the American political system in the 60s as just getting worse. And she's right. It does just get worse in the 60s. And the recognition that this behavior is going to destroy everything. And it's about an escapist fantasy or an escapist narrative about just getting away from all that. And it's a brilliant little story called Beam Us Home. Some of the other stories I think are, are which are better known, oh, I love some of the little fantasies like the man, Dor the man Doris said hello to, Death of a Salesman. She does these two stories, the easiest stories to understand. Death of a Salesman is about a guy who works for American the Earth government and he helps people sell crap all over the universe and there's difficulties by sending our products into alien cultures because they cause all sorts of havoc whether it's the smell of them or the, the advertising logos or you know they cause all these sort of cultural repercussions and it's a kind of one joke after another funny story just like um the one that i didn't i couldn't follow when i was a kid but the one about the this intergalactic dinosaur race. I know it sounds terrible, but it's actually a brilliant story about a guy who has to go around negotiating these millions of alien cultures. A very funny, satiric stuff. And then she does more serious kind of stories which really take a lot of close attention because she doesn't give us exposition. So if you read Isaac Asimov or one of these science fiction writers, they tell they, they explain everything that's happening. But she goes into these, moves right into these futuristic landscapes and doesn't explain to you what's happening. There, there might be a sentence here or two, but you've got to catch and be there and be there to catch it when she mentions it. And it's sometimes hard to follow. I still found some of these stories extremely hard to follow. And I think they're, uh, I'm too big, but I love to play, has some very difficult parts in it. And... Uh, Peacefulness of Vivian, and even Painwise, which is a well-known uh, story of hers, they take real attention. I'd really recommend reading any one of the anthologies she put together when she was alive. I particularly suggest going to this first one, because it has some of the simpler stories she did and some of the more complex stories. And it's a really uh, perplexing and enjoyable book. So try this. 10,000 Light Years from Home, James Tiptree Jr. Go to eBay, get the, get the original, any edition of the original book uh, and see what she put together back in 1973. It will seem, it will not seem dated at all. Okay, James Tiptree Jr. We'll do more. We're going to do more of her books, I promise you, uh, if I live long enough.